See that F-18? I heard it more than I saw it. Yeah. I did also see it. Guess I'm doing all right time-wise. That would have been better another 15 minutes earlier. So you know, Jamie, if somebody says, who the hell set up these chairs? I'm going to point right at you. You know, that's why I'm a little bit this way, because the sun is coming here, and I want to be a, have their backs more to the sun, which will be perfect. Yeah, because by yeah. that time, it, you'll be yeah, yeah. somewhere right up in there. Sure. So I think you'll Thank be you, good. Jamie, very much. Sure. Appreciate it. I'm nervous now, I'll tell you the truth. And I don't like that feeling at all. No, don't like it at all. Get <laughs> you bet. You can sit close. <laughs> Uh, boy. Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Antonio Ballesteri. I was born and raised in Monterey. I lived there all my life. I was born loving birds. Uh, I just love everything that flies. To me, flight is the ultimate form of freedom. You know, and I, as a kid, would make kites. If I have to pick an action hero that's my favorite, it's going to be Superman. I could care less about Batman, <laughs> Spider-Man. I got to fly and I got to fly well, okay? And I have remote control airplanes, I have drones. Uh, I, just, I just love that kind of stuff. And I'm afraid of heights, go figure, you know? Uh, but the closest I've ever gotten to flying truly is through the eyes of my birds. I mean, I have birds here that, I've, that took me months, days, years to establish a bond with, okay? A bond of trust. To have that bird release it and have it come back on its own, own free will is really a special thing because these birds are not domesticated. They're all from breeders or non-releasable rehab birds because you are not allowed to make money off of wildlife in the United States, okay? But they're, they're, there's nothing domesticated about them. They're born in captivity, but their parents are from wild stock, okay? So take that out of your head. These are, these are wild birds. If we had a dog out here, it'd be a lot easier. The dog would be sticking around trying to flush out the rabbit. One of my first birds, and she was a partial imprint. We were out hunting and I released her right after a molt. She hadn't been hunting for a while. And uh, she killed a rabbit and I reached down to cut it open because she loved to feed on the brains first. And she thought I was trying to take it from her. And she jumped up and grabbed me in the face, talon here, here, and here. My best friend was with me and he was saying, hey, what do I do? He was yelling and I said, don't do anything. Because if you try to grab that bird and pull it off your face, the bird could reach out with the other foot, grab you as well rip your skin. I just waited till she let go. Mm -hmm. I did, I set her free. How did that feel? It was tough, but it was a lot easier after she had attacked me. <laughs> so I'm a much better educator than I am a falconer, I'll tell you that because a good falconer comes with experience. You gotta have a good bird, but you gotta be able to go out all the time and you gotta provide game and you gotta be consistent. And there's a lot of great falconers and I don't consider myself a great falconer because I don't have the time to spend to go out hunting. Even in my prime when I was hunting with my birds, there were much better falconers than me, had better birds than me and were better at it than me. I will say though, that having a lot of birds is not really an advantage. That personal 
bond you have with your bird diminishes when you have too many birds because you can't spend the time necessary with them that I like to spend. So I'm much, I would be much happier having one or two birds. What I try to do is, is I try to bring one, or, one bird into the house each night, a different bird, and spend time with it on the couch if I can, watching Netflix, Right. okay? And this might be a bird that, you know, and I'll rotate them, that I normally don't use in shows, and I'll bring them in and, and spend time with them, you know? You seem to like that being in the house? Yeah, they do. Uh, they don't seem to like television very much because the, their, their brains work a lot faster than ours, so they see television as, as broken up segments. They, they, they see the individual frames, you know. Now I'm getting a little uncomfortable because we're getting too close to the road. And there doesn't appear to be any game here at all. Great horned owls are, 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 they're a funny creature. They, they should all be males in my opinion because they don't multitask worth the dam. <laughs> and they, they focus on one thing at a time. And right now she's focusing on me, but when we get out to a show and there's a, other external stimuli around, she doesn't know where she's at. She's concerned about other great horned owls. There's, there's people, she's looking at other things and I'm not a priority anymore and she acts as docile as can be, but right now, She's concentrating on me, and she does not like it. This is Regina. She's an imprinted ferruginous hawk. A lot of people actually think they're a hawk eagle or an eagle, and I believe that. They're a very, very powerful bird, very aggressive. Even though she's an imprint and I raised her as a baby, she'll challenge me every time I approach her. She's maybe a little on, this, on the smaller side for a male peregrine. Uh, but a female might be up to 850, 850 to 900 grams. She's 1,050 grams. She's a big female. But he's got a very handsome face, and she's got a very beautiful face as well. Because not all birds are created equal. Some birds are uglier than others. He's trying to look like Gonzo from the Muppets. He's one of the birds we need to, to have his beak trimmed. This is his brother, his older brother. This is Diego. And Diego is Ariel's backup. In case Ariel can't go into a show, Diego will be next. Does it get enormously expensive feeding all of these birds? Yeah, my monthly bill is probably, oh, $450 a month, <laughs> I'd say. Bella is a 2010 bird. She's 10 years old. She's a real sweetheart. She tends to throw temper tantrums though. She's the sweetest, I'd say, of all my birds, but she can turn at any moment. Something can trigger her, which can upset her, and then she will we'll go crazy. And she'll scream as loud as she can, and it almost sounds like he's hurting me. Come arrest him and throw him in prison, because he just hit me. Hey, Cuckoo. Ah, he saw my hat. Cuckoo. What? Guy's puffing himself up. It's all right. It's just me. Great horned owls are amazing. When they puff themselves up, they can make themselves out to be four or five times their original size. Hey, it's okay. It's just me. No. Come on. All right. First thing I'm going to do is wrap them around my little finger tie the leash to the glove but if i'm on my way out of this pen and i trip and my hand opens up and this bird flies off with the leash you pass you've got a problem come on get in there there you go go ahead turn around all right 
in his perch. He's nice and comfortable. Close the door. Untie the leash from the glove. Tie it to this little D-ring and we're ready to go. But I always tie the leash to the glove before I do anything. It's always good to be safe because a lot of birds have died that way. And I don't want that to happen today. So this transfer facility is managed by the Monterey Peninsula Waste Management District. And it's been here since I've been a kid. The reason I'm here is I'm here to actually meet a friend who's going to help me work on some of the equipment on my bird. But he has a contract out here where he tries to keep these seagulls off the garbage. But Leo flies his birds here six days a week, eight hours a day. And he's using his birds of prey to keep the seagulls off the garbage. He's trying to keep them airborne at all times. And one of the main reasons they're doing this is they don't want the gulls going over there and sitting on the, on the crops adjacent to the landfill and contaminating the crops, which could potentially cause millions, if not billions of dollars worth of damage. So a lot of the landfills that I know in California now are using birds of prey for bird abatement. So you want to wrap her up so she doesn't hurt herself by flapping her wings. Uh, and then you want to wrap up the feet so it doesn't hurt you. Yeah. Because if she grabs you with her eyes closed like that, she's not going to let go of you. So you can take a look at how the beak looks right now, right? So you can see it. Yeah. It's pretty overgrown. It looks really dry on the layers here. A lot of the literature you'll read, they'll tell the falconers, take a picture of your bird's beak when you first get the bird. Because then you always have that as a reference. What is that beak supposed to look like? I forgot. That's what it's supposed to look like. Because the bird can get more muscle and more fat, but the beak, that's a done deal. You can see this side, how it looks, and you can see all crusty over here. Yeah, so that's it's almost all... like a, like a hard water buildup. Like, like this Zorro. So you can see how overgrown this is, and we're just gonna grab it. I mean, technically, if you were to trim too much off the beak, you could cut it down to the quick. It would bleed, but it's not that long. You might think, well, why do you need to cope the beak? Well, most birds or beaks are perfect, but in nature, this bird is killing jackrabbits, it's killing uh, ground squirrels, uh, it's killing all kinds of different animals that have very thick, powerful bones. I'm feeding it quail, which have hollow bones. I'm plucking all the feathers. As you shape it, it's almost like, an, it's almost like creating a, a sculpture. I mean, it's, it, it's an art. The first thing of, of is, is to gain the trust of these birds. So once they trust us, they, they don't have to be freaked out when uh, when we put the hood because they already know that it's us. She knows that it's fine, like, like you know, we're not gonna kill her, you know? And and even if she's she's uh, uh, being touched and, you know, on the beak or whatever, you can see that she's okay with it, right? After I do the beak, they feel it, and, and when they start eating, when they start preening, they get really happy because now they can do it. Before they just make a mess, it's just really bad for them. But, again, they, they know. This was made by hand by one of Leo's buddies in Mexico. Okay, I love this hook, it's a great hook. This thing is a piece of garbage. This thing is so thin, you can see it's just uh, I don't know what I paid for this thing. I, I wouldn't pay five dollars for this thing. You'd be surprised that you paid more than five dollars. Yeah, that I know. That that hood seems to fit fit her pretty well, and it fits the Frugianus hawk pretty well. This thing is just garbage. You can see it's just paper thin. Yeah, no, she's she's great. I mean, this feed this bird is just a monster. Grab my hand. Grab it. Grab my hand. So. Yeah, she's a gorgeous bird. Look at those feet. So you can see the difference from the beak right now, how she looks and how she... 
and she looks like a bird again. The gonzo beak is gone. Yeah. It's gonzo. Yeah. Now she's going to be a little bit upset when I pull this off, but I think she'll recover fairly quick. I was a little gun shy when pulling yeah. that thing <laughs> off because if she reaches up and grabs my beak with who's her gonna, beak. Who's going to be gonzo now? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, girl, that's okay. All right. All right. There you go. Just glad to go back in her box. Good girl. Good girl. I didn't bring the, uh, you know what I'm missing is, uh, I'm missing thumpers hood, and I was using the uh, male fragrance, and I don't know where I left it. He's looking around like, no, 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 hold on, see? Look at that. Hey. Okay, that's it. See how easy you know, the birds are used to hooting? Yeah. Oh, those. Today we're going to Big Sur, and from doorstep to location, it's probably about 15 minutes, five zero minutes. I'd always been very uncomfortable talking in front of people, and I still am, but not when it comes to talking about my birds. Now, if you ask me to talk in front of a crowd of people about a different subject, hell no. It's very different. And I'm glad that I don't I that I look at it that way, otherwise I'd freeze up out there. And I think that's maybe why people like me is I'm very passionate about what I do and yeah, I'm passionate about my family. And the birds are my family, so and we're approaching one of the most visited destinations on the West Coast, and that is the Bixby Bridge. The famous arched bridge uh, right here on the Big Sur coast. And here's one of our traffic delays. That is just beautiful down there though. These little secluded beaches. You see rocks with holes in them where the water goes through one side, you know, like out down over there at that point. It's a couple spots like that. And this delay is gonna really put me close to being late. Also falconers, and for good reason, and myself included, don't like giving out too much information about how many birds we have, where they're kept, uh, none of that stuff. Because you always have those do-gooders that are gonna wanna come, some animal activists and is gonna come, wanna release your animals to saying, eh, it's, shouldn't have them in captivity, making a big deal out of it. Well, I tell you what, if they release some of my birds out of their chamber, especially with their equipment on, I mean, they basically signed their death certificate. So a good falconer is very secretive about what they do. I mean, a guy could be a falconer 
and be one of your buddies. And, and one day it just comes out to where he's a falconer. And you say, like a lot of my friends tell me, I didn't know you did that. And how long have you been doing that? Oh yeah, off and on since I was a kid. I had no idea you did that. Really? Well, that's not something that we like to talk about. I'm one of those lucky few people that was able to transition into another occupation. Yeah, very, very lucky to do that. To where my passion became my occupation. Okay, I'm gonna close the box because I'm gonna grab them and put them on my glove, on my hand without the glove. This, this is a full grown Northern pig owl, the second smallest owl in the United States. That is an incredible little bird. That is an owl. Okay, but what's interesting is he's a diurnal bird of prey. He hunts during the daytime. All right, he what's that? He typically eats birds. I mean, well, I'd say about half of his diet is birds. Okay, he he lives up in in conifer trees. He lives in the different strata of the tree, flying through there in the daytime, grabbing birds off the branches, and going away with them. Yeah, you know what? He can eat a bird up to three times the size, California quail. I saw a cartoon the other day where he's sitting on a moose, okay, and he says, oops, picked the wrong animal. <laughs> but the point being is that that's how tough they are. Roja is five years old. She can live to be 35 probably. And already I see some of you thinking, well, who's going to take care of the bird when you're gone, Antonio? That's messed up. Okay. <laughs> I've got it covered. Don't worry about it. All right. Show how long her legs are again. Yeah. Yeah, she's. This is a beautiful bird. But you can't handle the speed nature says. What do you mean I can't handle it? You can't handle it. Like it was that movie with Jack Nicholson. What was that movie? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You can't handle the truth. All right. Shape of the wings. The longest, most pointed wings relative to a size of all birds of prey. The wing design, those are designed for speed. Those are fighter jet wings. Those are not Cessna wings, okay? In level flight, he's only 75 miles an hour. He's got massive chest muscles, though. And you say, why? Because in a dive, he's pulling 27 Gs. He's got the best vision of any animal on the planet. He can spot a pigeon from two miles away. He's got monocular vision where he can see out of this eye independent of that eye. He is in a dive, his adrenaline is going, his brain is thinking 10 times quicker than ours. You put my brain in his body, I'm gonna crash the first day. I can't process things that fast. 33% of all peregrine falcon mortality due to the great horned owl. Number one killer of skunks in North America, great horned owl. Number one killer of crows in North America, great horned owl. Yes. Kills eagles, <laughs> eagles, other great horned owls, anything that moves. But the adaptations for this bird are incredible. Quiet flight, okay, is one of them, all right? The leading edge of her wing here looks like the serrated edge, like a comb, okay? See that? <laughs> the porns, they use them for camouflage, but they communicate with other owls during the breeding season. Plus, it makes her look like a cat. Cats are dangerous. If you have a cat up in a tree with wings, I'm scared. I just want to see her kill something. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't. B A L E S T R E R I. You're welcome. Oh, sorry, you got to be taking as many photos as you can right now. Edit it later. Come on, girl. There you go. Edit it later.
I mean, with this comes great responsibility. These birds are dependent on me for everything, and I think about it all the time. There, when it's like, oh boy, it's like being in college for years, and then and a lot of people experience this. They're they're finally out of school, but they have nightmares that there's a paper due, and they and they haven't done it yet, or they haven't shown up to the class for two weeks or three weeks, and there's a big exam, and they haven't studied for it. There's that anxiety all the time, like there's a something due and you haven't done it. You know, I'd have those dreams all the time. And if I were to give this up right now, they'd always be in my mind. You know, are are they okay? Is one of them tangled up? Have I fed them yet? You know, it's just it weighs on you. It's like having kids and you're just constantly worried about them. I imagine the divorce rate amongst falconers is probably close to that of of, the, of uh, police officers. You know, why, why? Because they're just, they're fanatics and the wives better be into it or they're, you know, they're in trouble, you know. A lot of falconers, every chance they get, they just want to go out hunting, you know. And the wives are like, nah, 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 man. we need to be home taking care of the kids and mow the lawn. You, you got a family, you got a responsibility, you know. It's a passion just like everything else, I guess, but just like an old surfer, old surfers never die. They, no matter what's going on in their life, they, they'll drive by and see a wave and say, hey, I'm going out there, you know. I, well, honey, but we gotta get these bills paid. Oh, I don't care. I, I, it's only gonna take me a few minutes, you know. And I'm often asked, you know, what, how did you get into birds? There's no other way to explain it. I was just born loving them. And I feel very lucky because of that. I, I never thought about it, say, yeah, this is cool. This is something I wanna do. It was just natural to me. It was just very, very natural. But I found a niche to where I, I, I like to teach people and I, and I want to share my passion. I, I mean, it sounds funny, but I, I enjoy sharing my passion. Not just having it, but sharing it with other people. Because it's, it's so obvious to me that these things are s such magnificent creatures. And, it, and my attitude is like, God, how could you not see this? I mean, this is so cool. I mean, check this out. I, it, it's just... And when people see that, and I, and I see that in my life as a child, when I saw something that really interested me and it sparked something that lasted for the rest of my life, I wanna do that with kids and at least give them an appreciation of these birds so that maybe they'll do something to help protect them so my grandson can grow up appreciating these birds like I do, you know? I, I think that's the main thing that I, that I, wanna, that I wanna leave behind on doing all this is if I affected somebody's life to where they'll have a better appreciation of nature in general, but of these magnificent creatures, you know. Yeah. Am I ever gonna be able to let them go? God, I hope I don't get to the age where, where I, can't, I can't be mobile anymore and take care of them because then at that point, I'm, I'm, it's gonna be a very sad day for me and somebody's gonna to have to take my, my, my birds and take care of them for me, yeah. That's gonna to be tough.
Easy. There you go. Good girl. All right.